Hi folks. You're very welcome to the Science Gallery this evening for what is basically the very last in our In Case of Emergency exhibition events. Uh, we're delighted to partner with the Health Research Board on our series Red Alert. And today we have, um, well I guess we're looking at a modern day epidemic which is anxiety, uh, a good feeling. Um, we are delighted to welcome a very diverse panel who look at both anxiety as a, uh, an issue, uh, stress and the human microbes that affect us. Uh, tonight our panel, um, Aoife, Jared, and Ian will be sp speaking with Dill um, about the subject. We'll probably do about an hour, 45 minutes of chat and then we'll open it up to the audience. So if you have any uh, fail-safe uh, anxiety reduce methods, uh, do keep them in your back pocket and let us know later on. Um, put your hands together for our panel and we'll get started. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, folks. What is it the word anxiety? That, just hearing the word anxiety kind of provokes anxiety. So let's just take a minute. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. We're going to have a lovely conversation. And we, by the end of uh, our time together, I think we're all going to walk out calm and maybe armed with uh, some tools, uh, which probably involve kefir, because that's what we've been, we've been talking about a lot, and how you can make them at home, and someone has kefir babies, we'll talk about them, uh, talk about that later, and how she reads bedtime stories to them. Okay, that did. <laughs> I wonder who that is. Uh, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit more about the wonderful panelists that we have um, for you today. So uh, we have Aoife McElwain, who is a food writer and creative events planner. She writes about um, food in the Irish Times and Totally Dublin. And a, a big congratulations uh, is due to, um, to Aoife because she's just published her book, Slow at Work, which looks to provide new tools to help navigate the world of work. And it's literally hot off the press, am I right? That's right. Yeah. Still, still hot, still mm -hmm. warm. Okay, and then we are joined by Ian Robertson, uh, Emeritus um, Professor of Psychology, co-director of the Global Brain Health Institute, and was the founding director of the Trinity College Institute of Neuroscience. And he's also author of the acclaimed book, The Stress Test, which reveals how we can shape our brain's response to pressure. Right, so that's uh, two authors. And then we have Jared Clark, who's a lecturer in the Department of Psychiatry in UCC, and also the APC of Microbiome uh, Institute at University College uh, in Cork. And, and I was I've already nicknamed him as the gut guy, uh, <laughs> which we will, we will talk about. And he also drinks kefir, uh, which is interesting. Um, I see a theme. Okay, so first I think, I, I, when I was thinking about uh, this evening, <clears throat> and I was uh, reading your book, actually, Aoife, I, I, there is a general consensus that we are actually living in a time where we are just so busy. We are busier now than anyone else in human history. Is this correct? Um, well, thank you very much for that introduction. Hello, everyone. Um, so I... Uh, have spent, I, I did an experiment myself, um, maybe uh, it was about a year and a half ago, where I gave up the word busy. I decided to stop using that word because I felt like I was trapped in a cult of busyness. That anytime I'd ask anyone or they would ask me, How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm so busy. You know, that was the answer. So I think it started, I, I wanted to figure out, like, if I stopped saying the word, would it actually affect how I felt? Um, would I feel more in kind of control of uh, the pace? Um, what actually happened was when I went off script and someone was like, how are you busy? And I'd say, no, I've just kind of taken on enough at the moment. It was like a little glitch in the matrix. <laughs> it was kind of an interesting reaction. But I think that um, we do feel like we are the busiest people ever. But um, you know, uh, there, there was the one book in particular that um, changed my mind around this and it's a book called uh, Exhaustion, A History. And, um, you know, the, the author talks about how the ancient Greeks were always, you know, talking about their waning energies and that in the 18th century people thought they had reached the pinnacle of busyness. So, um, uh, I think it's quite interesting. I'm sure hunter-gatherers probably felt exhausted by berries, you know, and gathering. And they were just like, I simply can't forage. 
I can't do it. I'm too exhausted. But um, also, I um, yeah, I, I think uh, th there is one thing that is different about about now, and probably every. Um, stage of time has brought new challenges to people, but our new challenge is uh, technology and uh, particularly our smartphones, I think, and how they add an extra level, an extra hum of anxiety. That's what I would say. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It makes, makes a lot of sense. And, and, and Jared, your, your book, um, The Stress Test, uh, I, I actually, I, I asked you up there and, and you corrected me about, you know, is there such a thing as good stress? Or, or is all stress bad? Yeah, <clears throat> so stress is a perception. It's the perception that the demands being made on you uh, of busyness, for instance, mm -hmm. exceed your ability to cope with them. And the resulting emotion is anxiety. And anxiety is not a disorder, it's not a disease, it's, not a pro it, it, it's a very important emotion. And so, like all emotions, it motivates us to, and it motivates us to take action, to take action to try and resolve the source of anxiety. And um, if you think about it, if I say to you, "Look, I had a beating heart and a dry mouth and tense stomach last year," sometime, what, what emotion would you say I was having? Uh, fear, anxiety. No. No. Stress. No. No. Were you in love? No. <laughs> I am in love, but that was it. <laughs> you ate something dodgy for lunch? <laughs> <laughs> no, Ireland had beaten England at rugby <laughs> and stopped them winning the Grand Slam. So, okay, um, excitement, <laughs> elation. So, that's, here's the remarkable thing. The symptoms of one emotion, excitement, are identical to those of another, anxiety. So, what does that tell us? It tells us we're dealing with a non-specific arousal system in the brain and the body whose job it is to prepare us for action, either to go and drink another beer and celebrate Ireland's victory, or and to jump up and down, or to hug a stranger, as I did on Saturday, or, uh, <clears throat> or to um, run away. So, uh, so how then do we know what emotion we're having? How do we know if we're anxious? Well, we only know we're anxious because of the context. So we, we label this non-specific arousal. And the label we put on it determines the emotion. This is called the James Lang theory of emotion that was proposed 100 years ago that we only know we're frightened because there's a bear there. And we, and we deduce that we're frightened because of that. So, so we have this um, chronic worldwide epidemic of people a lot of the time misinterpreting what's actually a, a motivating a set of physiological symptoms whose job it is to empower you for action as a negative medical state of anxiety. And the result is we're getting the huge overdose of drugs, <coughs> drugs and billions, hundreds of millions of people overdose. So uh, what's the, and the research shows that if you're about to perform, say, in a, do mental arithmetic in front of an audience like this, and then your errors are corrected, and your heartbeat is portrayed on a screen, if you just say three words to yourself, I feel anxious before you perform that, compared to three different words, I feel excited, you will perform better if you say the three words, I feel excited. Because you you, you're creating, using the power of your brain and language to create a new context so your brain reinterprets this energy. So there's a number of different ways. I won't go on now, but later on, if I have the chance, I can talk. The, the anxiety or, or the arousal associated with stress and anxiety is a form of energy mm. that can be harnessed for good or, e or ill, mm. depending on how we label it, how we, uh, our mindset approach to it. And there is this mindset, this busyness mindset, this, this threat mindset that's part of our modern culture, which leads us to interpret this arousal uh, in a negative way, and that causes a negative spiral. So that's Very interesting. Okay, okay, okay. Lots of points which I'm going to come back to. Um, and Jared, let's talk about your research because we, we just um, cause that's that's your contribution for for this evening. And I was trying to figure out how 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 to even explain your research because it's a bit of a mouthful. But thankfully, you said your research is how the gut brain um, impacts. Sorry, sorry, sorry. How the gut 
biome impacts on brain and behavior. So how, how is it, this all linked? Because often when we talk about anxiety, we think about it up here, we think about it in our chest, but you're saying it actually could be originating right here in our second brain. Yeah, so I mean, Ian has given a very nice uh, introduction there to uh, why we express uh, fear and anxiety. And I think uh, what our research kind of gets at is that maybe uh, your gut microbes are exerting uh, some level of control uh, over these feelings that, that, you, that you have. And the way we think that works uh, is because of the existence of this uh, brain-gut axis. So this is this, this two-way communication system uh, between the brain and the gut. And really what our research says is that uh, your gut microbes, the, the microorganisms that are resident in your gastrointestinal tract, can hijack this uh, communication system, kind of like a uh, microbial broadband uh, in a way, you know, so and there are, there are some it's wire probably connections. better than the broadband we have yeah. in Ireland. So. <laughs> Depends where you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so they can uh, kind of just recruit um, or hijack this signaling system either uh, via some of the wired routes, like this, your, your gut is very heavily innervated by a nerve known as the vagus nerve. Mm. And then there are also kind of wireless ways that can uh, send signals up to the level of the central nervous system. And we've been trying to get at uh, kind of the range of behaviors that can be influenced and how the microbes do this. And then once we know that, how can we intervene to try and beneficially control these signals? Wow, that's so interesting. And, um, <coughs> and Aoife, I believe your gut speaks Dutch. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I continuously in my work um, as a freelancer, but also um, before that when I was working for lots of different people. Yeah. Um, Being a yeah. freelancer is not easy, can I just say? Because yeah? <laughs> you have so many bosses. Yeah. So many deadlines. And the worst boss is yourself, um, which is the real kick. Uh, but, um, yeah, so uh, I, I realized that uh, I kept making the same kind of wrong decisions, uh, not to be too hard on myself, but I kept finding myself in you know, the same sort of overwhelmed position where I was working with people that uh, I wasn't happy with working with, who didn't make me feel empowered, or that I uh, was working on projects that I didn't really care about. Um, so I, I realized that I had just been listening to my brain a lot instead of being able to listen to what my heart was telling me. And then also, finally, I figured out that, yeah, my gut has been speaking Dutch this whole time, because I could not understand what it was trying to tell me. So I think once I realized, this is not based on science. This is not a scientific. <laughs> my gut probably doesn't speak Dutch. I feel like we should. I could. I could. Oh, no. If you were, if you were Dutch, much. Yeah. I feel like we should get a microphone and say, do you have anything to say? Aoife's <laughs> gut. Yeah, so, um, but just getting a growing awareness of the fact that, um, you know, I, I like the idea, so we, we've been talking about having two brains, and again, this is not scientific, but I, um, I like the idea of having three brains, so I have my head and my heart and my gut, so when I'm making a decision, I try and tune into those three things, because this is all information that, um, that I have at my disposal, so if I want to make the best decision, why not access that? So, for example, if I'm faced with a possible project, I might check in with my brain, which will probably say, you should really take this because you need financial security. Uh, that's my brain's voice. Um, <laughs> my heart will say, but it's not what I want to do. It's not with the people who I want to work with. It's not fulfilling my greatest destiny, etc. My heart's uh, pretty floaty, and then my gut will be like, danger, uh, the in person, Dutch. in <laughs> Dutch, in Dutch, <laughs> danger, in uh, Dutch speakers here, so, uh, <laughs> could translate, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> ah, sorry, <gasps> okay, good, good, good. Oh, my gut, this is my gut translator, Yay! Yay! Um, <laughs> So the idea there is um, basically I might have to listen to my brain there, but it means I can walk into whatever environment I'm going in with, with all of the information uh, that, that is at my disposal. And it's still something I'm, I'm working on and honing personally, you know, to be able to just try and um, through a growing sense of self-awareness to, to kind of pull on those, those bits of information that are there. So. Um, Thank you. <laughs> no, because I, I just think it's so interesting because I think there's something in us as humans that we want to overcomplicate things, you know? Uh, we want to kind of just 
That, that's too simple, you know, to, to actually go by what your gut is saying. And that's actually part of our language. It's, we've always been, you know, what does your gut say? What's your, what's your uh, gut hunch on this, you know? Um, and body wisdom and all this. So it's, it's not really new kind of information, but what is it do you think that we, um, as humans, don't, do, is there something that stops us to, you know, to go on that journey of maybe listening to our gut or our heart and often just let the brain kind of uh, drive us. Ian, what do you think? So, uh, I think that gut feeling is what we call intuition. And all the big decisions I've made in my life are driven by that kind of, you, where you can't do rational computations for, you know, because there are too many variables, but there's a sense in which the decision is made for you here. Now, it's not really made for you here, it's made here, but it's that interaction between the brain and the gut. And, um, <laughs> The great um, neuropsychologist Damasio called, you know, talks about the, the somatic marker hypothesis that there are certain, if we're gambling, for instance, the, you know, there's certain times when we, we, we avoid making a risky gamble for reasons we can't articulate, but because of a, a, actually that kind of feeling of difficult to articulate dread uh, or stay away from that. And that's part of our brain's intuitive processing, which um, uh, is, is, is probably interacting with the vagus nerve in, in, in com complicated ways. I mean, the, the, as far as we know, the, 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 the many neurons in the gut don't do computations, <laughs> as far as we know, but they do have a huge effect on the brain, and the computations are about decisions we make are, are made up there. But uh, in terms of being open to these intuitive ones, uh, we do have two at least two kind of modes of thought. One is, one is um, uh, very much left hemisphere dominant, uh, goal goal seeking, appetitive, reward seeking, and tends to be based on more linear, verbalizable processes. And then there's a more non-dominant hemisphere system, which is based on looser, looser associations, and it activate while creativity needs both hemispheres. There's a particular aspect of the right hemisphere functioning that has to do with solving problems in, in, in a, with insight and with intuitive processing. And the right hemisphere of the brain is more closely linked to emotions. Mm -hmm. It's more closely linked with the the, the, the inter interoception of the body. Mm -hmm. And so if we are over-focused on, uh, and, and the two halves of the brain are in competition with each other, mm. so they inhibit each other. So if you overuse and over-focus on, on, on these left hemisphere-based linguistic, verbal analytic functions, which are superbly useful for all sorts of things, they can inhibit these more right hemisphere uh, functions that are associated with kind of intuition and inside problem solving and that, that gut feeling. Yeah, so it's it's not, trying not to rationalize everything, you know. Yeah. Sometimes just wait, waiting to hear what the rest of you is going to say. And uh, and I suppose yeah. as well, um, if you know, if you think about it, even though the words are in our language, like good instinct and good feelings, mm -hmm. the way we learn about this is always separated. You know, when I went to school, I learned about the brain, but I learned about the gut separately. Mm. Uh, and the same <laughs> in college, you know, and it probably. Really, I would have to say when I came to Cork in 2004 that I started to appreciate that the two were connected, you know. So mm. it's, it's part in, of the uh, educational system as well and how we learn about it. Yeah, but, it, but I, I just feel even from a, from a mental health point of view, we just begin to realise that separating mind and body just doesn't serve us, you know. And uh, it's just the more holistic, the more... Because, uh, like, I got that the more. Let's talk about um, nutrition, you know. How is our gut at the moment, like you know, as a as a society, do we even consider our gut and our gut health? Because I think talking about schools, I don't think that that conversation is had properly about how to impart this this like, life life skills to to children to know that of course you know you need to look after your health, but you have to look after your gut because that ultimately is what could actually be driving your you know, your, your, the direction you're taking in life. Yeah, no, so I think uh, you're, you're pretty, uh, pretty correct there, I suppose, in that we haven't really incorporated nutrition research into how we educate our uh, mental health mm. professionals. Uh, so, uh, I mean, what, what the research would tell us is that when we talk about a healthy gut and a healthy gut microbiota, it will be one which is quite diverse and stable. And to get it into that 
configuration, your diet needs to be diverse as well. So you need to, uh, you know, have lots of fruits and, and vegetables, and uh, like we talked about, uh, kefir as a way of promoting uh, diversity as well. So is it kefir or kefir? I can never say. It I'm right. not sure either. I call <laughs> I think, it kefir. Yeah, <laughs> so, I call it kefir yeah, on the Tuesday yeah, and on yeah. the Wednesday. Because I can't think of kefir Sutherland. Yeah. Yeah. I think yeah. of kefir Sutherland. Yeah, yeah, kefir. kefir. All right, am I the only person who doesn't know what kefir is? <laughs> <laughs> Could you please tell you and, and whoever else here, what is kefir? Oh dear, now. Um, do you want to? Uh, I think you can take this one. Okay. All right. All right. So, um, yeah. Well, you can tell me the sciencey bits about it because basically, my kefir or kefir is um, the this magical little. Um, see, the said magic. And the scientists are like, she said magic. Yeah. <laughs> They're uh, falling asleep. <laughs> so uh, basically, in my little jar, I have um, a, a lovely raw uh, milk that I feed to my kefir babies who are, uh, I haven't named them all because they're sort of a, a lump of, um, they look a bit like cottage, cottage cheese, but what they actually are is um, a really rich micro... Um, bi- microbe ecology, I yeah. suppose, yeah, that yeah. just uh, feeds off the milk and then, and then grows and perpetuates. Yeah, so then yeah. I strain off the milk um, and it, I kind of have a process of two days, basically. So the milk goes in to the, into the babies and then they make the milk sort of turn into... I like going for two days, so the milk goes to kind of a yogurt. And so I have it with granola um, and... Uh, Blueberries and uh, I wish you had too brought a little sample. I know I should have done, but um, and what I so there's uh, Jer can tell you about the the research of um, what the this kind of cultured milk or dairy product uh, does for for our kind of um, mental health and also our energy levels as well. But um, for me. System. And it, yeah, and for me, anecdotally, I um, I do feel uh, since I started using it, I, I I feel better. I'm not sure. There's a lot. There, I've made a lot of kind of small changes in the last two years, so I'm not sure if I can identify it all to kefir. Um, but what I do know is that when I I notice when I start kind of neglecting my babies, um, when they've gone kind of four or five days without me giving them some new milk. And that is a way for me to check in with myself. It's kind of like a mirror. So, um, like, am I doing okay? Am I kind of getting pulled into the cult of busyness so much that I'm not kind of looking after my little kefir babies? So um, somebody called child services. I mean, no. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, so where's the, the science, science bit? Because I think <laughs> it's really interesting. Well, I suppose yeah. So if you look at the um, the research in a number of disease states. Uh, like if you look at depression, if you look at anxiety, if you look at um, the Western, uh, the way the Western diet has has progressed, I suppose, mm. it's leading us to a stage where our microbiota isn't quite as diverse uh, as it should be. Um, so all of these strategies, uh, key for prebiotics, uh, you know, food components that can stimulate the growth of beneficial bacteria, anything to promote the diversity uh, is going to be good uh, for health in general. And as we've learned more and more, uh, it's going to be good for your mental health as well. Mm. Yes. Could I ask Jared yeah. something? Yes, yeah. yeah, please. So I only discovered this recently yeah. that so serotonin is an important chem- yeah. neurotransmitter for affects mood, uh, yeah. among other things. But, but 90, 90% of it is produced in the gut, is that right? Yeah, so the largest kind of pool of serotonin in the, uh, the mammalian body is in the enteric uh, nervous system. Hang on, the serotonin is, what, is the hormone that makes you... So it's, uh, it's probably mood. best known as a neurotransmitter, which would be the target for antidepressants and yeah. also for anxiolytic um, drugs. Um, and uh, the, your gut bacteria can kind of stimulate the host to uh, produce that in, in the enteric nervous system. And they also seem to be able to regulate the supply of the precursor. So the building block for serotonin is tryptophan, um, and that needs to be available uh, in your uh, circulation to reach uh, your, your central nervous system. And it crosses the blood-brain and barrier. It crosses the blood-brain barrier, yeah. yeah. And wow. the, it seems to us at least that the level of tryptophan that is available is very much dependent on the uh, bacteria. Yes. Who also have kind of a slew of enzymes that can actually use tryptophan for their own purposes as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's incredible, yeah. really. Mm. Wow. Um, and uh, so let's talk about diet. Um, what, what is a diet that is going to help um, to have a healthy gut and also have a healthy emotional well-being? Um, so tell who, who would like to take that? Ian? 
No, I know nothing about diet. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I probably had a huge burger last night. <laughs> three glasses of red wine. So, I mean, I've killed off my microbiome. <laughs> okay. <No. laughs> So but he seems to be doing fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, I, I'm not a nutritionist, uh, um, and uh, I, I write about food. I mostly write about crisp sandwiches, to be honest, but um, which I love as well. Um, but I'm the Irish Times, you know. <laughs> it's a really esteemed crisp um, sandwich newspaper. Um, so, um, yeah, well, I think um, the, the things that we were talking about, probiotics, yeah. um, they're certainly, um, yeah, I, I'm not actually, you, you must but know. But there's other stuff um, that, we, we, that we're eating that can actually negate yeah, well, the work that we, you, you could have all the probiotics yeah. and all the kefir in the world, but if you're eating the wrong stuff, you, on top of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah so you mm. mentioned the Irish Times. In the Irish Times today, they talked about uh, some of the, the recent uh, trends for consumption of processed food. And Ireland is one of the worst countries mm, for right. very high consumption of ultra processed foods. Yeah. And they contain you know, emulsifiers and sweeteners. And if you look at the research, those things can affect your gut microbes and, and result in this narrowing uh, diversity. And kind of the flip side of that coin is if you're eating a lot more of these ultra processed foods, you're not eating the foods then that would be beneficial. So our Western diet has become very uh, deficient in fiber, for example. Mm. Um, so we eat a lot less uh, fiber containing foods than our hunter gatherer friends mm. uh, would have done. Um, and you know, these are the things that can help uh, because we, the fiber isn't for us, the fiber is for the microbes. Mm. <laughs> mm. And we're also saying a plant based diet yeah. is something that would be helpful as well. Yeah, you know, if you follow your, uh, if you get your Five or is it seven now? Fruit, fruit and veg a day in. Uh, seven. When, seven. when did that happen? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, when did it's, going up, it's going up. It's going okay. up all the time. So. Damn uh, it! Just when I got the five, sorry. Okay. And I'm anxious about that now. Great. <laughs> <laughs> and there's some really interesting research coming from. Uh, I'm sure you've seen this as well from Felice Jacka's group uh, in. Uh, no, I don't know that. In, in Australia, where. Um, she's interested in the Mediterranean diet and the benefits that that can mm. have, and it, it's in the context of depression, but not uh, anxiety, I suppose. But it's still relevant because you know anxiety is so often comorbid with uh, with depression. But what she showed was that if she took uh, a group of people who were uh, currently on antidepressants but hadn't kind of responded that well, mm. uh, and she changed their diet to a Mediterranean diet, so lots of oily uh, fish, lots of fruit and veg, lots of seeds, mm. lots of nuts. Uh, and she, she kind of boosted their uh, their response, and they were uh, had a better uh, profile afterwards. You know, mm. so um, it's interesting you say that yeah, because yeah. <coughs> the evidence is diet's very important for yeah. your cognitive health as well, and uh, all, all the things we're talking about here, mood, depression, and anxiety. Once and, and and diet, they're the risk factors for developing Alzheimer's later in mm. life. Yeah. Uh, and so there's a lot of good reasons for uh, you know keeping that balance of, of mental health and, and reducing anxiety and eating well. You mm. know, apart from just that it makes you feel better and reduces your anxiety, there are long-term effects on the brain. And yeah. then there's a the problem of sugar, isn't there as well? Yeah. Excessive sugar. It seems yeah. that that's more and more implicated in uh, uh, possibly being involved in the inflammatory processes mm -hmm. in, in, in Alzheimer's. Mm. So uh, yeah. But even joints, what I find if I eat too, eat too much sugar, I feel, I feel it in my joints yeah. uh, and then my immune system. I, yeah. I feel it immediately, like when I get, I get a bug <coughs> or whatever, it's because of maybe just after Christmas, you know, because for me, my, <coughs> my, my problem is chocolate. That's like, I can give up everything. I give up smoking, I give up drinking. Yeah, no worries, but chocolate. <laughs> Green and blacks for people. Yeah, uh, at this stage, you're bulk buying it these days and that's not good. Um, but it's, 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 it's becoming aware that we are actually not helping ourselves. And sure. I just find it so interesting that people, because I work in mental health and we have a practice with 50 therapists and we support 400 clients uh, a week. You know, there's a lot of people coming into us to talk about you know, anxiety issues, depression, uh, and, and other issues. And of course, there are certain things that you have to talk about, you know, because better, better out than in, but, the, but our diet plays such a big part in it. If, if only we could just connect the dots uh, we could go to a place where they would, okay, you can talk to someone about any trauma, but then you talk to a nutritionist as well, and you talk to someone about their, about your gut. And mm. So are you going to say something there? Yeah, I was just going to say, we have to be careful we don't become fetishists mm. about our diet, you know. Mm. And there's, 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 a lot of, there's a lot of people can be suffering from anxiety, and then they channel it into their body. Mm. So you get somatization. 
and then you know you can get unhealthy preoccupations with what you're eating mm. and uh, you know with uh, food. you have an eating disorder after that yeah, yeah. yeah. and um, it can kind of become unhealthily not quite obsessive but but the, you, you feel that the the solution to your unhappiness or your, your anxiety is going to be eating and, and as Jerry was saying you know it's basically <laughs> If you eat a balanced diet with you know, a lot of yeah. fruit and vegetables and a bit of nuts and uh, some fish, you'll, you know, that's probably about as good as you can do. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah, well, that's as far as... <laughs> Is that rocket science? Yeah. No, no, it's just, you had burgers, okay. <laughs> Occasional <laughs> burger, I'm not... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> very good at cheese and onion. Oh, oh, so. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I think, I think the, the big challenge about anxiety, and that's what we're talking about here, is... Um, to, to, for us to take control over it again, mm. take ownership and not medicalize it, mm. not psychologize it. Mm. You know, to see, to see it as a, a part of... The human experience. Human experience. Mm. And if we do that, then the problem with anxiety is um, it, it can tip you into to a, a mindset. Once you, once you start to see this as a medical disorder or, or this external threat to you, this thing, then that puts you, it creates a threat mindset where your, your whole memory system is biased, becomes biased towards remembering past failures and past, ang past bad times. Mm -hmm. And your attention system is biased towards noticing, you know, picking out the expression in the audience that's frowning. You know, I, I don't see anyone, I can't see you, but you know, <laughs> in an anxious state, my, my mind, my attention system will selectively zoom in on yeah. signs of disapproval, of signs of rejection. And that will make my anxiety worse. Yeah. And that will make me remember past signs of rejection. And that will then increase my anxiety. So you get into this, and that is more of a link to the neurotransmitter noradrenaline, yeah. uh, that which is part of the fight or flight system. Yeah. And that tips us over into a situation where we can't think as clearly because we're producing too much noradrenaline. Whereas if we, if we regard anxiety as, you know, as something, you, you, you know, it's something yeah, you have to have and, and it's, it's potentially harnessable as a form of energy, that puts you more in a challenge mindset. And in a challenge mindset, which is more linked to the neurotransmitter dopamine and the left hemisphere function, where you're more inclined to notice opportunities for reward. So I see the person smiling and nodding, agreeing with me. We like to be agreed with there. <laughs> and my past, I remember past times where someone, you know, praised me rather than, and so our whole mental system becomes biased in that way. And the medicalization and the, the psychologization that goes on of, of anxiety can actually uh, go against people being able to own this emotion and, and use it. Because the evidence is quite clear that uh, anxiety-free life is the last thing you want. Mm. <laughs> uh, for our children and adolescents, children and adolescents and young adults who grow up with no adversity, with no stresses, once they hit early adulthood, they're much more vulnerable to, mm. they're, they're less happy with their lives, they're more likely to report post-traumatic stress disorder, their quality of life is lower, because they've got no, their they're psycho, uh, biological system has not been inoculated against stress. Once they hit middle age, if they get low back pain, they're much more likely to be in heavy painkillers, to be off work chronically and to be disabled with the same pathology in the spine. Mm. And when they get older, uh, the people who are maybe in contented retirement in the 70s, um, very few demands or challenges on them. Their brain maybe isn't stim producing no stresses, the brain isn't producing enough noradrenaline, mm. and then something stressful happens, like a horrible thing, like their spouse gets very sick, then, then uh, they end up being cognitively better as a result of that. Not very pleasant, but nevertheless stressful challenge. So stress is something, we, if we own it, now severe stress is a different matter, but moderate levels of stress are good for us if we adopt the correct mindset mm. and the challenge mm. mindset, and we must avoid other people, whether it be uh, doctors or uh, counsellors or psychologists taking ownership of mm. that and, and putting us into that passive threat orientation. Sorry for talking so long. That's so interesting. <laughs> That's yeah. so interesting. Yeah. Oh, wow. yeah. 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 Uh, that, I, it's beautiful what you said because you know, when I, whenever I think about 
you know, all the stuff that I've been through, and anyone who knows my story, I've been through a hell of a lot of trauma, um, layers and layers of trauma. And for, for years, they used to think, oh, why did this happen to me? You know, and why didn't I have the perfect childhood and all this? But now, as a 44-year-old woman, I'm actually thankful for all that crap that happened when I was a kid. Because I know like, things like when life turns, uh, throws me a curveball, like a recent curveball in September. <coughs> Boom. <laughs> News talk hook. <coughs> you know, when that happened, you know, if, if I hadn't been so used to um, experiencing stress and you know, uh, I suppose uh, hardships in my life, I would have probably curled up in a corner. But like, I, I woke up the next day and said, right, let's get on with it. Uh, wow, so that's really heavy. That was a bit of a, a, bit of a breakthrough for me. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me know how much I owe you for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Aoife, can I ask you, what made you write slow at work to begin with? Because I think, because um, uh, you're a food writer, mm, you know? Yeah. And, and I think I, I found it really interesting that this is a topic that, that is not, not, that doesn't quite fit in with your day-to-day -day work. Yeah, um, so uh, I do a lot of uh, different things. I, I love to work and uh, I, I probably, yeah, so I write about food, but I'm also a, an events planner and uh, so I... And it is busy. Yeah, and I, I yeah, well, yes. Uh, other people can say the word. I don't use the B word. Uh, no, it's fine. So it's fine. <laughs> it's, it's fine. <laughs> but something that I didn't have, which I think uh, Ian has just spoke about, is I didn't have the skill of resilience, I think, um, against stress. Um, so um, as a, like, I'm a compulsively busy person, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to harness my anxiety. This is a really new thing for me, you know, to... To, I, and I love the way you described it as an energy force, mm -hmm. you know, because like my anxiety got me here an hour early for this today. And I am a chronically late person, but it was great for me to be early. So that's the kind of force that got me here. Um, so anyway, I, I wrote the book because um, two years ago I uh, hit kind of peak burnout. and. I felt as if my, you know, the pilot light inside me had just gone out, like it was just like a wheeze, you know, just like a uh. um, And uh, I was, um, yeah, I was uh, depressed and I couldn't, um, I, I had, had really severe imposter syndrome as well. I found it really difficult to, like, kind of take the achievements that, that were sort of on paper, you know, the things that I was doing and uh, yeah I couldn't really absorb them and um, I, I had to stop and uh, I had to stop and rethink and kind of reevaluate how I was approaching work and how closely linked my work was to my identity mm. so I've um, you know uh, yeah and I really liked I don't know if you guys are into Carol Dweck and her ideas and oh yeah big of, time fixed in the growth mindsets and she mm. reading her book um mindset and she's carol dweck um it really it was like just reading my own kind of life biography basically of someone who had been really highly praised as a kid and i lived in a small community and i was one of the talented kids and so uh, you know, I started to really fixate on being the, the talented kid, the overachiever. Um, so then uh, what t can happen to kids like that is when they reach teenage years, they suddenly realize, like, if I yeah. try and fail, then I'm not that thing that I've been told my whole yeah. life that I am. Um, so that kind of, and there's, there's um, Dweck kind of maps out the fix and the growth mindset of, you know, someone with a fixed mindset is really kind of threatened by criticism, whereas, uh, and, and really afraid of failure, because the failure isn't just, oh, I didn't write a great article, it's, uh, I'm a failure as a person. Mm. Yeah. Um, so mm. whereas it's someone with a, yeah, and so when someone with a growth mindset could um, see it, you know, of course they'll be upset with challenges, but they'll be able to see it as a challenge, and so, you know, to, to and then the good news <coughs> is that you can kind of retrain um, your brain to be, to go from being fixed to growth, so I suppose my book was a way for me to try and dive into a few areas that I kept coming up against at work, so things like procrastination and the imposter syndrome, and then the gut, like learning Dutch, <laughs> and, uh, you know, uh, so, um, 
so yeah that's that's and and so it was an amazing opportunity for me to just really deep dive into my own <clears throat> approach to work and kind of try and unpack some of those internal things and then also some of the more external things like technology and how connected I was to my smartphone and how mm. you know creating boundaries around that yeah uh, re- retraining the brain is <laughs> Um, I, I came across this when I, was, when I was pregnant with my son Phoenix. I came across this app called Gentle Birth, which basically retrains your brain to um, how you perceive pain, and it's incredible. I, I had I had a home birth, didn't need gas and air or anything because my brain, instead of thinking the pain was um, a threat, that which would, would then um, produce adrenaline, which kind of makes you climb up. <laughs> Instead, my brain was telling me, because of the training I did, the brain was telling me every surge, we call them surges, we don't call them contractions, because contraction sounds too scary. Uh, <laughs> every surge is bringing me closer to my baby. And, and, and that was, <coughs> I, I think it's so incredible. So when it comes to anxiety, there is ways of retraining mm. your brain. And as you said... I see, that's precisely what I was talking yeah. about. Mm. Yeah, I'd never heard about that in yeah. relation to... Oh, I tell you, but, I, yeah. I had, had a home birth. I'm, yeah. I'm really, my wife just had a great home birth six months ago and, and talk about over-medicalizing. Don't get me started about the over-medicalization yeah. of, of birth. Um, but Ian, tell me, what got you interested with in this area and this research to begin with? Because I, I, Well, I'll tell you what happened... <coughs> um, I had a, the last event was a, my best friend in Cambridge got run over by a bus and lost his right arm and both legs smashed and he was, he was in a bike and oh, uh, the grief. and um, yeah and uh, this was about five years ago and uh, uh, you know it, people were very pessimistic about his chances of recovery but he's you know he's now cycling you know hundred hundred miles and he's, you know with one arm and, and he's just an amazing guy so he he kind of prompted me to. I, I'm a bit of a Pollyanna figure, you know. I tend to see uh, the good, you know, the op- be an optimist and all that. And, and um, so, uh, you know, I said, I, I love Nietzsche's statement: "What doesn't was mich nicht umbringt, macht mich stärker. What doesn't kill me makes me stronger." And uh, you know, when some, uh, you know, one of my I grum- know, that wasn't Dutch. What's that? What's that? <laughs> that was German. That was <laughs> German. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um, one of my German uh, postdocs remember saying, "Yeah, like polio." <laughs> 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 Oh gosh. And so th- that kind of got to me, you know. And I thought, am I being a, am I being a Pollyanna here? So I, I kind of I decided to to look at this question of, you know, does do bad things strengthen you, you know? And um, and it turned out, and I, I've studied the brain for 35 years, and people with brain damage and traumatic brain injury, and I've studied. I've ended up. I realised I've been stud- studying stress, if you like, because I was studying this arousal system and noradrenaline, the neurotransmitter, and all, the, all my 35 years of what seemed like completely diverse re- research fell into, fell into place in the concept of the sweet spot. The idea that most of the brain's neurotransmitters have an upside down shaped function, where too little of the, the, of the neurotransmitter, your brain underperforms, and too much and underperforms. It's a sweet spot in the middle. And that is finding that sweet spot, and there's a number of, and, and you know, finding that sweet spot artificially in people that have had a traumatic brain injury. You, if you manage to get their arousal up, get their noradrenaline, get their these symptoms, stress, inverted commas, up, you got their brain performing much better because this is the basic energy for the brain and the body, indeed. And so I realised that um, uh, that probably. Nietzsche was right, and my, the conclusion in the end of the book was, yeah, Nietzsche was right. Uh, what doesn't kill you does make you stronger within limits. Mm-hmm. So the, within limits. So this adversity thing, um, this adversity thing where people have, a, you know, the, the blessed, uh, you know, blessed young man or woman who is first in the class throughout their lives, they, they're popular, they're the one invited to all the parties when you're sitting at home and they're, and they're the, you know, they're just the golden boys and girls. Get the cubs. <laughs> yeah, they just, they, 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 they just have such trouble when they hit the real world of, of work in their early adulthood because they've just ne- they haven't, they even get they, they get scared of anxiety the fear of fear. These mm. symptoms become like this alien thing 
And then that then, because of no experience, they, 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 get, they get frightened of it and that feeds it even more. And then they go to the doctor and they give them an antidepressant. Yeah. And that fixes them the fixed mindset because mm -hmm. taking that pill is a sign that this is something, a disease outside of yourself, mm -hmm. which sabotages the growth mindset you were talking about, mm -hmm. Eva. And um, so that's, so it, you know, I just became, and then I became horrified by the statistics in, when I wrote the book in 2013, the population of England was 53 million, and there were 60 million prescriptions of antidepressants that year. Mm. You know, many of them multiple ones, but just the mass medication mm. of the what we're doing that is completely undercutting the capacity that people have to, to be in control of their own emotions with some very simple uh, approaches, you know, which include, to, include nutrition. Yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd just like to, to say something a little bit about that. And, um, Come back to you. I, yeah. Sorry, Joe. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> um, I... Um, Joe's taking notes here. <laughs> <laughs> I started taking antidepressants uh, a year ago, and it's been a... Uh, just one part of me being able to actually support myself yeah. to get to a new growth mindset. Yeah. So I think I'm, I'm, and, and it was something that's so interesting. Like I wasn't sure if I was going to include that in my in my book because of the sort of stigma yeah. around mental health here. And then I thought, like it was actually such an important part of my road to recovery yeah. and to feeling it. And what I notice about it is. Um, that what it helps me do is it helps me uh, maybe it's it, it helps me manage my energy because I'm not in that kind of anxiety trap I, I, I feel yeah, yeah. do you know you're using and it as a tool yeah. that you're in control of but which is a fine. part of yeah. many other yeah. tools yeah. not yeah. just one tool exactly. yeah and I think I really really agree that when it's you know this is going to fix you um, that's I, I don't think yeah. that's that's really full and that's not the whole picture but um, I, I just wanted to, to say that, you know, it's, it's, it's part of my um, structure. It could be, uh, just in case there's anybody else out there as well. Who yeah, I, I'm glad you said that because I'm not, uh, of course, people need antidepressants. But the problem is there are 20 times as many people getting them now yeah. than when I was training yes. in the mid-70s. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And we, do, yeah. We, we have not got 20 times the degree yeah. of clinical depression, yeah. you yeah. know, that we had then. And there's so many people getting them unnecessarily yeah. when there's actually relatively simple things that can be done. No, it is and not although they might be yeah. necessary, in some instances, they're never sufficient on their own. No, exactly. No, because yeah. I just I remember yeah. my own experience. When I think it was 2006 when I first, uh, yeah, 2006 when I first started start having serious issues with my mental health. Um, and I went to a GP because you think that's where you go, you know, when you have health issues. And, you know, you go to one of these places where you meet a GP you've never seen before. Uh, and just he just asked me three questions, and then he gave me a, a prescription for Lexapro because right? I said I was feeling stressed at work. He didn't even try and ask me any other questions, you know. And I walked out of the surgery going, "Okay, he's just giving me medication. I, I can't remember it's anti-anxiety or anti-depression tablet." And I remember, "Okay, this is really scary. Uh, uh, let me see if I can do something else before I, I come back to this." You know, so I ended up then going to the services of One in Four, great charity that helps survivors of sexual abuse, and then that kind of helped me. But um, yeah, so coming back uh, to to you, uh, Jared, just you know, in all of this, um, can I ask you what what made you actually you know, choose this area of, of work because it's, it's fascinating stuff. But what led you to to be the gut guy <laughs> 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 on this panel? Um, well, I suppose it's probably a combination of love and luck. Uh, so around about uh, 2004, my now wife uh, moved to Cork, so I followed her down there. Uh, not in a stalker kind of way, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, joined, I joined her in Cork, I didn't follow her down. This, this hashtag me too thing is just wrecked our conversations, yeah. And uh, I suppose the luck element comes into it then, and that round about that time in Cork, uh, Ted Dynan uh, yeah. was, that, was after after coming back to Cork and the APC Microbiome Institute, which is this SFI funded centre looking at host microbe uh, interactions, was just being set up. Another so thing that Cork likes to boast about, yeah? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> among, among other things. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. It's the best. I'm not from Cork, so you know, I don't have, to, don't have to glorify it too much. But um, So, I mean, that, that kind of really uh, started uh, things going, I suppose. And around about the same time, this really interesting research paper uh, came out from uh, a guy called Sudo and some of his researchers. Uh, and what they showed was that if you grow up germ-free uh, and you're stressed, 
you have an exaggerated stress response. And if you agree with the sentiment that it's not the stress that kills us, it's how we react to it, then the logical conclusion is that how we react to stress is somehow controlled by our gut microbes. So it kind of spiraled from there towards uh, the, the, the range of things that we're interested in, in now. So. And when I, mean, I was talking to you, because I have to ask you this, um, I will really, really become aware of uh, gut health since I've become a mom and, and breastfeeding and how breastfeeding actually, because there's this concept of the virgin gut um, about, this was introduced to us, I think, by a home birth midwife who said, uh, you know, because before we used to, uh, babies um, would, be, would be put on solids at four months. But now the latest research says, you know, try as, as long as possible to breastfeed at least till they're six months and then start them on solids. So, so this research shows that breastfeeding is, is uh, I suppose, the, the healthiest option. I'm trying to be very sensitive here, okay? Because yeah. whenever we talk about breastfeeding, it, it really is a sensitive topic. Um, but I'm wondering about so many people have been were not breastfed, you know, and how does that I suppose, compare when, like, when, you call, when you talk about gut health and later on in life? Yeah, so um, I suppose... And I'm not judging, <laughs> okay, it's just a conversation. Okay. I suppose the, the history of psychiatry might be a li little bit bedeviled by things you can blame your mother for, mm. but... Um, <laughs> Listen, <laughs> we run, I run a counselling practice, that's all people talk about all day, is they blame their parents. <laughs> yeah. But uh, if, you, if you look at the, um, the way that your gut microbe is seeded and is assembled, then it's very heavily influenced by, uh, by your mother. So essentially, uh, in, in utero, you're a blank slate, uh, and then you get your microbes uh, postnatally as you're being born. Yeah. Uh, and then, so if you're, if you're born uh, per vaginum or, or if you're born by C-section, initially you're going to have a different uh, microbiota. And what? Unbelievable. What? That's well, amazing. Well, you get your, uh, yeah. you, your microbes if you're born by C-section will initially be reflective of the skin microbes of your, of your mother rather than the, uh, the gut and the vaginal. Oh, or, wow. of the nurse, yeah, yeah. or of the nurse. Who yes, yeah, yeah, or the, yeah. the, the hospital yeah. environment. Yeah, yeah, but now what, what I've heard is they're actually trying to, for C-section babies, they're actually trying to take them, they're doing kind of almost a smear and putting, you know, yeah, so that, that's putting a little, that, those that's microbes a, on the baby. Out. That's a little that bit controversial yeah. uh, at the minute, but yeah, uh, yeah so there, um, the idea is, is that it would take a kind of a gauze and swab the, yeah. the vaginal yeah. fluids and yeah. then try and promote uh, the uh, assembly of the gut microbiome mm. with the way it should naturally be assembled, yeah. I suppose. So after you're born then, um, the other things that influence uh, your assembly in this initial kind of trajectory. So you go to about maybe the age of three before you get an adult-like uh, microbiota, but then breastfeeding versus formula feeding mm -hmm. is also going to lead to a different uh, <coughs> microbiome path, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose. Now, the research is saying that by the time you're adults, it probably catches up, you know, and even probably catches up by two or three. But still, you have to remember that, that this initial period, these are kind of critical windows where your gut microbe biome is assembling, but also when your uh, brain is being developed. Yeah. So uh, that's that's why we think that's important in that context. It's fascinating. No, because I'm just so interested at the moment, because I'm, I'm we are tandem breastfeeding. Um, I, my son is two and a half, and we have a five-month-old. So I'm breastfeeding my two and a half-year-old and also um, a five-month-old that my wife gave birth to, and she's breastfeeding Phoenix. and. Uh, five months and I keep thinking Phoenix, uh, who's got obviously the best quality of milk from me, uh, and then now Anne Marie's, he's going to be some kind of superhero or something because <laughs> <laughs> he, he's just really strong. And I'm like, oh my god, like everybody around him could be coughing and spluttering, <laughs> and he's like, yeah, whatever, you know, cough at me. No, it's fine. <laughs> well, um, there, there are a lot of things in breast milk that you can't or the baby can't digest. It's, that's for the gut microbes. <laughs> so that's where the uh, the idea comes from. So, so, so interesting. So, um, wow, I feel I could just talk about an hour just on that, <laughs> but I feel that I can't hog you. You know, it's not, it's, I, I can't be selfish. Um, so I ha have to, I've been told I have to share you with the, with the audience here. So do we have any questions? Because um, I'm sure uh, you all look very sciencey. You're going to ask some very complicated sciencey question. Ah, yeah, here we go, over here. We have, uh, you might just say your name. And My name is Lena. There's your microphone over there. Hi. How's it going? Um, I've been incredibly, unlike your greatest fangirl of the APC microbiome unit, yourself, Ted Dinan and Professor Cryan, um, have interested me massively. And I follow a ketogenic diet in an attempt to moderate the anxiolytic effects of sugar-eating bacteria. 
I'm just wondering what kind of evidence you've seen for this, because for myself, I've certainly seen um, a massive change in both my mental health and my gut health. I suffered IBS and kind of depressive symptoms throughout my life, and that's what kind of sent me on my own path. So I'm a kind of an independent researcher, very intrigued to hear your response. Wow. Well, thank you for mentioning IBS, because yeah. we haven't mentioned that in our conversation. Yeah, so we do uh, a fair bit of work with uh, IBS, some of it uh, Health Research Board um, sponsored. So we talked about the... Um, uh, Huge thanks to them, by the way, because <laughs> this tonight wouldn't have happened yeah. without them. We talked about the, you know, the, how you react to stress being important, and one of the things we've shown is that if you acutely stress somebody uh, with IBS, uh, their cortisol levels, of course, will shoot up. Uh, but what, what goes up should come back down, and it just kind of stays up a little bit longer uh, in somebody... Uh, with IBS. Now, I, I don't particularly um, get have much um, background in the ketogenic diet, but uh, I suppose the other area in, in IBS is this idea of a FODMAP uh, diet where you eliminate uh, certain foods from your uh, diet that can then alleviate uh, symptoms. Now, that has been misinterpreted um, in uh, a lot of ways because if you look back to where that was originally meant to go, it was meant to be a challenge. Um, because a lot of the foods that you're eliminating uh, have a high nutritional uh, value. So it was only really to see... Um, Sorry, what, what is a ketogenic diet, just for people who don't know? Uh, I'm, Am I I'm, really asking for myself, yeah. really? I'm going to pass this one on. <laughs> I, I can't, oh, we go back. I yeah. can't speak of it with great um, authority, so maybe, yeah, yeah. Nina, you could yeah. tell us yeah. a little bit about the ketogenic diet. It's basically, uh, it change, changes your metabolization. It changes your energy from a carbohydrate or glucose burner to a ketone burner, which is your primary source in the womb of the mother's fat systems, you wouldn't have taken that on. So, um, yeah, you, so you burn fats, you, you fat adapt and you restrain. You have a, a insulin, it's non-insulin um, reactive, so you flatline with your insulin response and, and, and you curtail the biota that survive on carbohydrates. So I've heard that they're the, the most um, successful species on the planet Earth, that they can actually dial out through the vagus nerve for pizza, for sugar, and all the rest. They direct our behavior, in fact. Right. <laughs> but I might be taking it too far. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. But ketogenic is ketone burning, so it's a ketone very, burning. very low carbohydrate diet. So what you would eat is, um, say, eggs, avocados, yeah. lots of brassicas, broccoli, cauliflower, um, upper, no kind of starchy or sugars, and try to stop an insulin response, mm. essentially. It's, it's a, did it help people with the seizures? Yes. Yeah, uh, hang on, isn't there a movie stops, about uh, this? The, what's uh, that? the electrical response in the brain is calm yeah. as well as a result. There was a movie about this, Susan Sarandon was there. Oh, was the, your mental I think that's high, it's, down, a very, so. yeah. it's a high saturated fat diet, I think, yeah. Yeah. for the, the epilepsy, that's oh, different. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, it's different, all right. Yeah. Were you going to say something for that? No, no, I, no, you yeah. Know, yeah. Okay. I told you I was going to be sciencey. Were you happy with that or was there anything else you want to add to that? Okay, wow. Very sciencey. Anybody else? <laughs> oh, very good. Up, just here, right in front of you. No, it's just alcohol wasn't mentioned. I was wondering the effect of alcohol on the gut. Not the sensitive not topic. anything else, only the gut. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I suppose, funnily enough, the, uh, your gut microbes do have enzymes that can metabolize uh, alcohol. So if you, uh, I suppose, if you consume too much, the idea is that those particular microbes then might start to dominate uh, in that environment and uh, people have linked that to maybe uh, the uh, hangover feeling the next day. But one of, one of the things that might link this is the leaky gut kind of concept, uh, which is that, um, you know, if, you're, if your gut microbiota composition goes a little bit awry, then that might compromise your, your barrier function and increase the intestinal permeability, leading to a leakage of kind of uh, bacterial products or bacteria into your circulation, and that could promote a kind of state of low-grade uh, inflammation. Mm. Wow, very interesting. Right, so any, any other questions? Nah, over there. Um, there's a, there's Hello. a lot of different information, sorry. <laughs> there's a lot of different information, like, you know, the, I'm personally trying out the FODMAP diet, and then there's another one here, and then I find I can, there's certain things I can take and certain things I can't. It's very hard to combine all the information into one place or find someone, yeah. like you said, you went to your GP originally and then 
do you mm. do you feel like there is like a, a source that you can start with I don't know if this is too much of a general question mm-hmm. in order to kind of lead you on the path because I find there's just so many different yeah. versions yeah. of what is best to do yeah. I, I, before um, we go to Brandon, just w- w- one personal experience I had um, when I was uh, pregnant I was diagnosed with gestational diabetes I uh, never had diabetes before but apparently when you're if you're Asian and you're there's certain boxes that I ticked. I was overweight and all the rest. And, and, and I felt exactly like you because I had the, the maternity hospital tell, telling me, you know, go by the food pyramid, which would actually, um, you know, eating carbs would have actually sh- shot my insulin up. I ended up going on a paleo diet just for, for, what, for the time that I was actually pregnant. And then by the time I actually lost three stone, and baby came out just perfect size, so no, no injuries, yay. Um, and, but I felt like you, I was like, why, why isn't there you know, accurate information about this uh, in relation to what is good for, for our health? Is it, yeah. is it, is it uh, like we don't want to be conspiracy theorists, but are there other forces at play here in relation to getting people to eat the wrong things? How do you think? Um, well, I mean, I guess this, there has to be a reason from a marketing perspective why Ireland is consuming 50% of, you know, why it's so high in the, uh, the processed food consumption. But I think in general, I, I would think it's important to say at this point that, you know, if you're going to go on to a particular diet, then that should be done in consultation with a dietitian. Uh, because, for example, I started talking about the FODMAP diet and, and kind of drifted off it a bit there. But if you're going well, to eliminate it again, the FOD? FODMAP diet, so it's elimination of uh, fructose, oligo, disaccharides and polyols. Uh, so these foods, vegetables like okay. onions and stuff can contain these. And that in IBS, for example, can lead to bloating. And uh, people find that if they eliminate one of those particular foods from the diet, it can help with their symptoms. Mm-hmm. But, what I, but the point I was starting to make earlier on was that um, it, that was meant to be in a challenge situation. So you eliminate kind of these FODMAP containing foods and then reintroduce mm. um, ones at different points to see which ones you can tolerate and which ones you can't. Because you don't want to get to a situation where you, you eliminate a whole lot of beneficial foods from your diet and you're not replacing them mm. um, uh, with the nutrients that you're missing out on. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all, all of these um, diets should be uh, taken in consultation with a dietitian is what I would, uh, I would argue. But going back to what you were saying, Aoife, you made some <coughs> life-changing um, uh, pink stuff in the last couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> and you can't quite uh, say which one helped most, but you know, ultimately you made those changes. Yeah. You, you went out and did the research and found out what, what works for you. Yeah. It might not necessarily work for somebody else. I, I'm it. a big believer in, in you know, I absolutely yeah. go to a dietitian, go to a yeah. GP, go yeah. to everybody mm-hmm. else, but mm-hmm. do your own homework and see what works for you. I think that's it, and because uh, it is really, really frustrating trying to get um, information about and and food, especially with like um, especially with the clean food movement, which I'm really, really uh, not a fan of at all, um, and I'm not a fan of detoxes in any mm-hmm. way. I mean, that's even not against my phone. I'm not suggesting that people put their phone away as forever, like, hello, cat videos. Um, <laughs> like, it's fun, you know? So uh, my, my, what I have done is I have experimented with lots of really small changes, and it kind of started with breakfast. So, you know, I just found that kefir and granola and blueberries is what set me up for a day where I feel able to do the things that I want to do. And so the other things are um, going to a therapist every week, um, st- making the decision, which I thought about for a long time, to take antidepressants. I swim in the sea twice a week. Oh, wow. Um, that's not for everybody. Uh, <laughs> Unless you're the happy no, pair. No, they're always in the sea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're always in the sea. Every day they're in the sea. How do they run a business, people? <laughs> Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I love them, I love them, but yeah. So, um, so and I think um, for me, one of the most important things uh, that I learned and changed was um, creating a boundary between myself and my work. So, um, and a big part of that was about making recovery time a sacred thing. So that is uh, what athletes call their rest time, you know? So when an athlete trains, they have their warm up, their training and their recovery time. And that's just not something that many other professions apart from like teachers have it, like they, that's amazing. My, both of my parents are teachers. And I get really annoyed when people are like teachers, you know, they have the whole summer off and it's like, they need it. Yeah. 
Um, they absolutely need it. And, you know, we should be jealous. I mean, maybe that's why we, we are jealous. <laughs> Actually, uh, yeah, we are jealous about it. But anyway, the point is, is um, I think uh, I've started to think of recovery time as part of my job. So it takes me about two hours to drive out to Dunleary, get into my wetsuit and my gloves and my socks. Wetsuit? Ah! Yeah! I thought so. Wimp. I thought so. Wimp. <laughs> exactly. Have you ever had a wetsuit? Wet <laughs> oh my God, of course I wear a wetsuit. It's, uh, it's <laughs> Ireland, people. This yeah, is not Barbados. It's really cold. So, so, yeah, if you have to wear a wetsuit, I mean, that's the thing. I think um, there's... Uh, around... Um, yeah, so if you have to wear a wetsuit or if you have to... Um, you know, find the right diet, find the right um, recovery time for for you. You know, um, I think that's that's the best you can do. It can be trial and error as well. I think. Um, so yeah. Uh, anything you'd like to add again in relation to nutrition? No, no, I just no, but not. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> just okay. about alcohol. If you drink a lot of it, it increases anxiety. Yeah. You know, and again, people mislabel it, and sometimes go and get treated for the anxiety where actually the cause is the, the alcohol. The alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. And, and also, you know, so some alcohols can be depressant as well, so if you're, if, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Ah, uh, you've talked about a lot about like, adapting your diet and changing your diet to help your mental health symptoms or just to help your gut symptoms. But what about changing your microbiome, changing your gut, like with, I don't know, Fecal transplant or something else like that—is that, is that uh, to address? Would that help change <laughs> your mental health, or is it possible? Even? Um, well, I, I guess it's maybe uh, a little, a little bit drastic at this stage, but it's an interesting, <laughs> it's an interesting thing because one of the really kind of fascinating uh, areas here is that uh, some of the studies have shown, and we've shown ourselves that if you transfer a disease-associated microbiota into uh, one of animal models, you can transfer the behaviour, so you can transfer the anxiety, you can transfer uh, the depression-like behavior, you can transfer the stress phenotype <coughs> via the microbes. Uh, now, I think what you're talking about is the, uh, the way fecal microbiota transplantation has been used for the treatment of recurrent Clostridium difficile uh, infection, and then out of that has sprung uh, kind of the concept that maybe it might be useful in other uh, areas as well. And, you know, it's been investigated for things like inflammatory bowel disease mm. and other gastrointestinal issues. Uh, I think where we're going with that is that uh, a lot of biotech companies are really interested in this now and they're coming up with more palatable ways, <laughs> I suppose. So, uh, you know, they call them crapsules, but like... Uh, <laughs> what? Crapsules? <laughs> define consortium of bacteria in a pill that you can uh, take to try to uh, reset uh, your, your microbiome. So uh, I think maybe that's something that will be an option in the future, but we're, we're, not, we're not quite there. <laughs> Wow, that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it, I think it's also the, the don't just because you were saying earlier, you know, about over medicalizing something. But just don't look yeah. at the gut as the only. Because the thing is, you could go through all those, and then because you haven't quite changed your whether it's how you eat or whether you, the environment that you live in or the job that you do that is causing anxiety, you could end up having that again. Like, you know? yeah. So um, yeah. And, and okay. the other thing I suppose to say is that. Uh, I probably haven't emphasized enough. This is this is bidirectional, you know. So stress at the level of the central nervous system uh, can change the composition of the microbes as well. So, as as you said, if you if you pop these capsules and you reset your microbiome, uh, then if you haven't changed the way you're dealing with stress, uh, it it may ultimately bring you back to the original uh, bad kind of set point. <laughs> I'm thinking of someone who had a who had an alcohol issue and then had a liver transplant and then. Uh, didn't change their drinking and yeah, yeah that's yeah. exactly I mean yeah. this is this is an organ transplant we're talking about uh, yeah. effectively yeah. you know yeah. <laughs> so. um, just you were, you were talking about fecal transplants um, oh maybe the halfway point is probiotic supplements and things like Alfluorex I'm surprised they haven't been talked about and maybe you could uh, probiotics we did talk about but what was the other one you said yeah, well well just the APC microbiome oh. have their own oh. probiotics and yeah so one of the um, like a the APC, that some certain spin-out companies have come off of, one of them would be uh, Elementary Health, and they have uh, this probiotic known as Alflorex uh, here, or Align in America, which uh, has shown some potential utility for treating some of the symptoms uh, of irritable bowel syndrome. And uh, just this week, uh, my colleagues back in Cork, uh, Ted Dine and John Cryan, launched their book, The Psychobiotic Revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, so when we talk about psychobiotics, we're talking about 
uh, probiotics or now prebiotics as well uh, that might potentially have a mental health uh, benefit. So uh, these supplements that you can take to try and uh, beneficially intervene and mould the response of your gut microbes, I suppose. God, I feel, I feel I've learned so much. <laughs> Orla, you have a question? Do you, do you see that moving into the kind of world of like precision medicine, sort of? Yeah, no, that, absolutely. That's one of the ways it could go. So uh, what we don't know yet is whether, uh, how people respond to some of the, these probiotics or the psychobiotics we've used, whether their response is contingent on the composition of their, their microbiome. So I think maybe again down the line in the future, what we'll see is people uh, having a gut check to see what their, their microbes is like, and then maybe we'll have a precision uh, a mixture of uh, probiotics or psychobiotics to try and uh, tailor the response to that particular individual. It, it's so kind yeah. of like diagnostics and then you know, a Yeah, no, that there's, uh, I mean, we've seen just uh, last week um, the development of this handheld device for sequencing the human uh, genome, which, you know, uh, so if, if we build it, they'll come, I think, is the, uh, the answer, you know. It's all happening in Cork. <laughs> <laughs> I'm conscious of time because I know that one or two people have to run before eight o'clock. I think we might do one more question. If there's one. Over there. Um, hi, thank you. Um, I have taken maybe 50 courses of antibiotics during my lifetime <laughs> uh, for various things. Um, I was just wondering, is there a place in Ireland or anywhere in Europe that you can go and before yourself and get tested and take it from there? See how... What what's the damage has been done? Uh, you mean to check your to check your, check your mi microbes? Micro my microbes. Yeah. So I mean, there are uh, companies uh, that will will do this. They'll send you a kit, uh, and you can check. Now, it's not it's not a diagnostic, uh, or it doesn't have any diagnostic value at the minute. It'll tell you what your your microbes are like, and maybe uh, you'll know um, kind of which ones aren't as abundant as they should be afterwards and there may be some kind of strategies then that you can use to try and uh, increase the ones that are available but it's important to, to note that they're not a, a, a diagnostic uh, entity yet but mm. you know there are companies in America, companies in, in the UK um, like I'm not sure if you know Tim Spector, he's um, a researcher based in, in London who is involved in a lot of twin studies, he ran the British Gut Project where they were uh, looking at the um, composition of the gut microbiome, so that you could send your samples off to them and, and, uh, and get them checked. And that, that followed on from the American Gut Project, which was trying to do a similar thing. So, Thank you. And if it's left to its natural course and recovery, have you uh, any data how long it takes for system uh, out of balance to kind of balance itself? <laughs> Yeah, well, it tends, it tends to bounce back pretty quickly uh, within a couple of days, I think, once you've finished a course of antibiotics. Uh, but I guess, suppose the problem is if you're taking Too repeated uh, doses and you don't, it doesn't... So it has, just like your stress system has a resilience, your microbiota yeah. has a resilience as well, particularly if it started off in a diverse state. Um, so if it wasn't so good to start and then you take an antibiotic, then you might have problems. <laughs> but if it's, if it's diverse before you take the antibiotic, it should be resilient enough to, to bounce back following it. But it's just if you have repeated courses of them, then you need to think about um, some other ways of getting it back to its healthy state. Well, thank you so much. Very good. All right, brilliant. Well, thank you so much. I, I've learned so much. I've got a whole list of words that I need to go home and Google. <laughs> <laughs> um, so put, put your hands together for Jared Clark, um, Aoife McElvain, and Ian Robertson. A quickly plug if has book, Slow to Work. Great book. I was reading it. And of course, the stress test as well. Is there anything we need to plug for you, Jared? 